right. Hello, everyone. So I'm Dominic Scheiner. I mainly work on this intersection of blockchain and IoT. But before we jump into the hardcore, techy, distributed ledger stuff, I want to talk to you about ANTS. And, and the, main thing, the main reason why I want to talk about ants is because they're quite fascinating creatures. So the thing about an ant is that a single isolated ant is, is rather disorganized and simple. So it doesn't have the latest Intel microprocessor. It doesn't have a very fancy graphical processing unit. And, and most importantly, like being quite frank to you, ants are rather dumb. But the interesting thing about ants is that if you bring them together to a mesh, to a colony, they actually start to having this emergent intelligence because a colony of ants can do rather complex things, right? They can build hills, they can go through very difficult terrain. And sometimes ants can even build boats just to cross a river. So through this collaboration we, and, and through this information sharing of ants, we actually get some kind of intelligence out of it. And, and the biggest question that derives from this is like, where does this intelligence actually come from? Like, like why, are these, why is a single ant dumb, but why is the entire network of an ant hill, of an ant colony, really intelligent? So the question is, like, does an ant have a subscription to a cloud service? Pretty obvious one, it doesn't, because an ant does make an API call to a cloud and says, hey, like, where can I find food? And then it waits for the cloud to return back a decision. That's not how ants work, right? They don't have any sensors. They can't connect to, to TCP IP. So how does this actually function? And, and, and the main reason why ants are intelligent is because of this network. The, 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 the mesh, the colony of the ants, um, and builds up this intelligence that derives from, from ants collaborating with each other, from ants sharing data constantly. So the beauty of ants is that through pheromones, they're constantly sharing data with each other. And by sharing data, ants are able to, to get a signal. And from that signal, an independent ant is able to make a decision. And this decision happens in, in this collective fashion. And there's this very interesting concept called holonic. So an independent ant is an individual actor. But at the same time, it's also the whole network. Because a decision, uh, a single move that a single ant makes, it has an impact on the entire network, because the entire network reacts on this signal, on this decision of an independent ant. And the beauty of this system is that now you get this emergent intelligence. Now you can start making smart decisions with dumb actors. And, and, and so how does this actually fit into the Internet of Things? So, so, so many of you have probably seen this picture of the Internet of Things. And if you look very closely to it, you can, you can start seeing that all of the, those threads, all of those connections come to a single centralized point. And that single centralized point today is the cloud. So, so the paradoxic thing about the Internet of Things is that it's called Internet of Things. But it's no longer about Internet. There is no TCP IP connection. There is there's no like, like global ubiquitous networking, right? And as such, the, the, the big question is like the Internet of Things that we think of today with, with the cloud, is that really the Internet of Things that we envision over the, uh, evolving over the next five to ten years? And obviously the answer is no. The Internet of Things that we have today is, is simply uh, an intermediary step. It's simply like utilizing the cloud to make decisions for smart devices. The thing is that if we want to start evolving this intelligence away from the cloud towards the network, we need to start going down this rabbit hole. We need to start going towards the edge. It's no longer about having like big data centers, but it's all about being able to make decisions in this local setting, like being able to have a, a, a local computational base station in proximity to devices, and devices can start sharing data, they can start sharing decisions with each other, and through that you get the same signal and a reaction process that ants have today. And, and we always call this going away from cloud towards fog and miscomputing. And so fog is obviously this ubiquitous, in German you say navel, because it's everywhere, right? And being able to make decisions like, like sending data to a base station, to a, compu uh, to, to, to a computational base station, in this local setting means that you now can start making decisions in real time. And, and at the end of the day, everything that we want to do is we want to make, we want to make decisions in real time. And the only way to have this real time decision making is through fog and miscomputing, being able to make these decisions locally. And if the clicker works, can, 
Okay, that works. And, and, and we always call this going towards smart decentralization, because what we have today is we have a pretty smart setting. We have smart devices that have sensors, that have, that have network access. Sometimes they can even start making decisions locally. They can collect data and so on and so forth. But the problem is that we have a cloud as the decision maker. All of the data that the, that the device accumulates is sent to the cloud. The cloud processes that data and then sends back a decision. Now, here's the problem. Like, if having this centralized point of, of decision making now means that if you cut it off, you ha only have smart, very expensive devices that you can't do anything with, right? And, and, and now we go back towards this dumb decentralization, which we had before this whole internet area, where we had decentralized, uh, a decentralized network where devices couldn't do anything. All they did was a simple process, do A or do B. But the, 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 the way that we want to transition, the, the way we want to evolve into is this smart decentralization. So we have a decentralized network where devices are connected with each other. And they're connected to, to, to other devices which, which are able to, to be delegated to. So you delegate another device to make a decision for you. You, you no longer interact with the centralized cloud, but, it, but this entire decentralized network makes decisions locally. And so through that, you start having this emergent intelligence. And you can start making decisions in real time. And the beauty of the system is that it's no longer just about sharing data constantly, because sharing data, for one, is, is a beautiful thing. Like, like aunts share data via pheromones. So they share data with, 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 with some, some enzyme. And, and devices can do the same thing by sharing data. But why just stop there? In, in, instead of just making decisions, you also want to have an entire new economy. And we always call this the economy of things. So having this machine economy where devices share data, but they can also share resources. And for the first time ever, we can now have devices which are able to sell their access capability. So for example, one device has access storage or, or access bandwidth or computational power. So now that device can start selling that, that access resource to another device which, which needs it badly. And so through that, you can start regulating this entire network and get a network of devices that really start collaborating and interacting with each other. And we don't envision that those devices are going to build boats. But instead, what they're going to do is they're going to make smart decisions for, for our smart cities, for, for our mobility infrastructure, for energy trading, and so on and so forth. Because only if you have this, this, this local environment, instead of having a centralized point of failure, you can start making decisions reliably and also very smart, smartly. And another thing that we always argue for is that ownership is outdated. So in, in the future, machines are going to be independent. So this machine independence now means that the, that the device is going to have a wallet. Now, with this wallet, it can do two things, obviously. It can pay for resource, but it can also earn money by providing resources to other devices. And uh, giving devices this ability to, to transact with each other is obviously only possible with a distributed ledger, which I'm going to talk about afterwards as well. And, and now here's the very interesting thing about this part. So, so before I was talking about ONS not having any graphical processing unit, not having any like, like Intel microprocessor. But the, thing, the, the same thing applies to, to our embedded devices. Our embedded devices are very simple. They do, they do one thing and they do it really, really well. But in the future, the way that this is going to evolve with, the, with this machine economy is that the single device is still going to be dumb. It's, it's not going to have like, like, like super powerful computational um, um, execution, or, or it's not going to have a lot of storage simply because it's the Internet of Things, right? Internet of Things basically is syn 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 synonymous to, to resource-constricted environments. But the beauty is that if we now have this machine economy where, where devices start trading with each other, we, we give a single device the capability of a supercomputer, the capability of a data center, simply because it's able to acquire this resource via, via other devices in proximity. And now you start really unleashing the Internet of Things because devices are no longer bound to the hardware, which now means you, 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 you can start developing new use cases and new applications on top of this ground layer, which the Internet of Things is really meant to be. And, and, and so obviously, like, why am I talking about this stuff? And, and, and so back in 2015, so, so we are mainly blockchain guys. So we've been in this blockchain space since 2010. And, and back in 2015, we started developing a new architecture, a new distributed ledger architecture specifically for the Internet of Things. And like was mentioned before, it's no longer blockchain. Because blockchain has some, some limitations in this Internet of Things setting. And so what we did is, is we went on this quest to actually develop a new architecture, 
And, and this new architecture is actually the Tangle. And the very interesting thing about the Tangle is that it's also, it, it has the same properties as, as, as this decentralized network of ants. Because now we can start having this self-organizing and self-healing system where, where the majority of the network really ensures that, that, the, the, that the decisions which are made are smart and they benefit the whole. And, and, and that is basically the quest that we went on enabling the Internet of Things by, by, and, and making it possible for devices to start trading with each other by having a wallet, by being able to transact with each other. And, and, and that's also why we've set up actually a non-profit foundation here in Germany just for this purpose. And, and what we do is we, we work with a lot of large corporates, and, and what we really want to enable is, is to, to, to figure out what works and what doesn't. Because blockchain is a lot of hype, as, as you might know. And, <laughs> and, and, and so we, we do a lot of experiments, actually, and, and figure out what works and what doesn't. And one of, the experiment, uh, one, one of the experiments which we are launching in July or early August is actually making it possible for sensors to start selling their data. So we are building a data marketplace where sensors start trading with each other for this data. And the beauty of this system is, is that now you can start having more, more diversity, more ubiquity for your data and for your data analytics. And this is one of those experiments that we're launching. Another one is focused on bandwidth on demand, where you start selling bandwidth access on demand, so paper byte that you send through a gateway. And, and that's pretty much the presentation that I have so far. So any questions? And you have to speak into it. <laughs> Testing. No. Does this work? I yes. think it does. <laughs> That's a cool okay, microphone. Uh, just a generic question. Tokens are all the rage. Uh, comments. Any? I just want to hear <laughs> anything in general about your experience with the token stuff. The few, no, you can't make. I'm sure you can't make statements of where you think it's going in the future. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But just your experience and how much you know. Are tokens here to stay? Are they here to stay for you? Yeah, no, for, sure, for sure. For sure. Whatever you want to say. Obviously, my, my opinion is biased <laughs> because I have tokens. Uh, but, but, but the thing is, I definitely think that tokens are here to stay. Because now you have, an, because the thing is, in this machine economy, you can't have euros, you can't have dollars, because there's no financial institution that can enable this transaction settlement between machines. Which now means that you need to have a completely new economy where devices have their own token that they can transact with. And, and I definitely think that tokens and also like distributed ledger in general are here to stay because they serve a real, real purpose. And even though, like, like I mentioned before, it's so much hype right now, there's still some, some, something unique about them that, that no other protocol out there today can replicate. And, and Bill Gates always said that, that we overestimate what happens in the next two years, but we underestimate what happens in the next 10 years, right? Mm. And so when it comes to blockchain and the Internet of Things, we need to stop looking at the next two years. We need to stop looking at profits that we make from these tokens, but instead looking at applications which we enable over the next 10 years. Because that is where the real value of, of blockchain and Internet of Things and this intersection comes from. I'm curious to know, what's your business model when it comes to collaborating with uh, corporations? Yeah, so, so one thing that should be noted is that we are a non-profit foundation. So we are a Gemeinnütziger Stiftung, which we're currently setting up in, in Germany, actually. And, and we don't have a business model with corporate, uh, with, with, uh, uh, cooperating with, with corporates. What we do, our main interest is to have our protocol being adopted. So what we do is we, we, we do these case studies in collaboration with some consultancies. So obviously, the consultants for running this case study, they earn money. But we, as, as the protocol developers, we don't charge money for, for being able to participate in these case studies. Because what's important for us is this feedback loop, right? Because if, if we are able to see hey, like how our technology is being used in the real world, we can start having this feedback loop to figure out what needs to be improved, what needs to be changed, and so on and so forth. Because at the end of the day, we want to build a standard, right? A global transaction settlement layer. And that's how we are approaching this, this solution of, of, of get coming from, from proof of concept towards a standard. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, actually, I've read your paper, so I know you uh, have this <laughs> idea that uh, you will have the coins generated at the beginning, yeah. plus you have this assumption that all the nodes have the same computing power, usually. Otherwise, it will be a bit difficult to keep the whole tangle yeah. persistent. And uh, then my question is that, do you think then the whole idea will be really scalable, or it will be just islands of Fox everywhere. No, for sure. Uh, 
So, so, so the whole thing about IoT is that it's a hierarchical system. There's not going to be an embedded device that is going to do everything, right? Like I said before, we, we have like not, not just general purpose devices, but like really application-specific devices in the future. And those application-specific devices then interact with a hub or something else, like, like what, what I was describing about fog computing, those are kind of like hops that other devices can utilize. And it's the same with blockchain, because at the end of the day, you don't want to have every single device run a blockchain, because it's a huge bottleneck, obviously, like you said, and, and, and IoT is resource constricted. And as such, you, you need to have this hierarchical system where we're now on, on a higher level layer. You have those full nodes that are able to participate in, in the network and transact. But there are some very interesting ways to actually mitigate the trust issue in that regard, so, so that a single like, like, tiny device can still start validating transactions independently. So through that, you don't have any trust requirements. 